Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Casey Davenport. I'm an engineer at Tigera working on Calico. My name is Dan Winship. I'm an engineer at Red Hat uh, working on OpenShift networking. And uh, yeah, we're here to talk about how the tables have turned, um, specifically uh, our journey moving Kubernetes and, and Calico from uh, IP tables to NF tables. Um, quick rundown of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start just with a brief overview of IP tables and NF tables, um, some history about them and their, their usage in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, then we're going to talk about why we need to leave IP tables in the first place and how we ended up on NF tables as a replacement. Um, finally, we'll talk a little bit about some of the initial results from uh, the work we've done so far. Uh, yeah, so a lot of terms get thrown around here. IP tables, NF tables, even IP tables, NFT. Um, both IP tables and NF tables are tools that allow you to configure networking in Linux. Um, and they're both primarily split into to two parts. Um, there's an API component that exists within the kernel. Uh, and there's a user space component. There's a tool that applications can use to read state from the API and write um, configuration back into that API. Uh, and under the hood, both of them are configuring NetFilter, um, which is the primary packet manipulation system um, within the Linux kernel. Uh, they both can do things like packet man manipulation, forwarding, um, filtering, NAT, et cetera. Um, and in the early days of Kubernetes, um, we picked IP tables uh, as the service implementation in kubeproxy, as well as network policy implementation in Calico. NF tables existed at the time, but it wasn't quite as mature as IP tables was. It wasn't quite as ubiquitous as IP tables was. And so it was, it was the right choice at the time. Uh, along the way, uh, IP tables NFT came along. Uh, this was in IP tables version 1.8.1. And it sort of acted as a drop-in replacement for the existing user space tool that provided the same feature set, but under the hood was talking to the NF tables API. And this allowed kernel development to switch from IP tables API over to NF tables API without disrupting the ecosystem of applications that had been built on top of IP tables. Um, it's worth noting though, that even though we we're using the NF tables API under the covers, Applications are still limited to the, the feature set and capabilities of IP tables when using this. And it, uh, it caused some problems in the Kubernetes space uh, specifically. Um, as we went through this switch, it was important to make sure that everybody's using the same version of the tool. Otherwise, you got some pretty unexpected and, and undesirable behavior. So, um, both Calico and kubeproxy ultimately ended up with some auto detection logic that helps select what version of the tool chain is being used um, on the system. Nowadays in 2024, this pretty much always resolves to IP tables NFT. Um, and the work that we're doing is actually to move off of IP tables NFT and instead talk to, uh, directly and natively using NFT to the NF tables API. Um, this is currently beta in Kubernetes 1.31 and Calico 3.29. Um, and this actually enables us to leverage the full feature set of the NF tables API uh, and everything that it offers. Again, worth noting, we're going to have the same transitional issues here. Uh, you need to make sure that all users of the system are, are agreeing on the, the tool version. It's quite possible to program state with NFT that just can't be parsed by uh, IP tables NFT. Um, and it can lead to bad things. Uh, looking forward, this is kind of how we see the future. Um, IP tables is going to be gone entirely and everybody's just going to be talking um, to NFT. Uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 has already deprecated IP tables and has said that it'll be removed in the next release, which is coming in the next year. Um, we expect other distros to follow. So um, why are we ditching IP tables in the first place? I think it's worth calling out um, a few things. First, 
Uh, IP tables wasn't really intended for what, what Kubernetes does with it. Um, it was designed as a single node firewalling system, not as a general purpose uh, service implementation and firewalling for dozens, hundreds, potentially thousands of, of pods across the cluster. Um, an example of where this breaks down, in IP tables, you need to acquire a node-wide lock, download the entire rule set, make your change, re-upload it every time you want to make a change. And while this might work fine for a single node, when you've got, like I said, thousands of pods, tens of thousands of pods across large clusters, this rule set can become very large, and this operation can become very slow. Similarly, in Kubernetes, you've often got several, four, sometimes five, um, users of IP tables on a single system. Like we said, the first hurdle is getting them all to agree on the same tooling version. Um, because you need to download and re-upload the whole rule set, it's possible for one component to write a rule that just can't be understood by somebody else. Even when you get everybody on the same version of the tool, there's a question of whose rules come first. Um, IP tables exposes a limited number of shared resources, hook chains, that uh, each of these components needs to share. And this can sometimes result in fighting um, over ordering of those rules. Uh, and finally, the global lock, which we already touched on, can result in some noisy neighbor issues. Especially in hyperscale clusters, you can get into situations where all of these components are spending a majority of their time waiting for the lock to free up, then downloading all of the rules that every other user on the system has written before being able to make their changes. Specifically talking about Cube Proxy and Calico, we contend over um, two tables, NAT and filter. Uh, and as an example of what that looks like, um, here's where uh, a snapshot of some Calico and Cube Proxy rules uh, in the forward chain. Um, Calico in particular likes to be pretty aggressive about putting its rules at the top of this chain. And that's pretty important because you want to make sure that your network policy is actually being enforced. Um, this usually works out, but it's not too uncommon of a case that a user might want to put some custom rules in that aren't from QProxy or Calico to meet whatever bespoke networking or filtering requirements that they or their organization may have. Um, this can lead you to be uh, basically you have to make a choice between being confident that your network policy is being enforced first or having the flexibility to uh, implement whatever custom logic you need to. And uh, yeah, the final reason that we need to move away from IP tables is that it's, it's legacy technology. Um, development has stopped on IP tables in the kernel and all of that development has been moved over to NF tables. So we want to take advantage of these new features and fixes, um, we, we got to move to NF tables. Like we mentioned, um, Red Hat 10 is planning to remove IP tables altogether. Debian 11 is going to make it an optional package, so not installed by default. And uh, yeah, we expect this is the way that most distributions are going to go. Uh, luckily, we have NF tables. So, um, NF tables, the API improved on a lot of these limitations. Um, for one, you can operate on individual objects. You can modify an individual rule, chain, set, map, etc. cetera. Um, and you don't need to download and re-upload the entire rule set every time. Uh, in addition, each component can define their own tables. They can specify their own hook chains with distinct numeric priorities within those uh, tables. And this means there's no, there's no fighting, and it becomes very easy to, to, to look at and say exactly what order uh, things are going to be implemented. Uh, plus, a lack of a global, global lock means uh, you don't have these noisy neighbor, neighbor issues. In, in addition to just API improvements in NF tables, there's also an expanded feature set that we can leverage. Um, I call out a couple of them here. Verdict maps are a big one. They, in several places, allow us to turn lists of rules that are uh, grow in linear time into constant time map lookups. Um, there's also small improvements we can get from being able to combine multiple actions into a single rule. Um, and just generally, the map and set constructs in NF tables are way more flexible 
which are just going to allow us to implement things that we couldn't have even really considered in IP tables. Uh, so as a, as a corollary to before, this is what sharing NF tables looks like between Cube Proxy and, and Calico. Um, and you can see completely distinct, um, each, each component gets its own table. Even though we're both using filter forward chain, um, we can define distinct numeric priorities to set which order those are executed. Um, and we can operate pretty independently of each other. Um, additionally, if you as an administrator want to come in and define your own rules, you can do so with your own table or tables, um, your own hook chains, um, and you can place those specifically in the order of operation that you'd like. Uh, and it's worth noting, um, you can do that confidently because drops take precedence. And so if your network policy denies something, it's, it's going to be denied. You don't have to worry about accidentally bypassing all of the policies that you've carefully crafted. So uh, we already spoiled the ending that we end up with NF tables, but how did we get there? Like, What were the other possibilities for getting away from IP tables? So one obvious uh, answer would be IPVS. Uh, IPVS is a kernel-based load balancer built into Linux. We already have an IPVS backend for Kube Proxy. It's been there for several years. It has pretty good performance. Um, the details of this graph you probably can't see, but it doesn't really matter. The, the blue is IP tables and the green is IPVS. And you can see that for smaller clusters, there's not much difference. But when you get to 5,000 services, the IP tables is getting a little bit slow. And at 10,000 services, it's getting really slow. Um, so the IPVS mode is pretty good. And for a while, we thought, yeah, maybe that's what's going to replace IP tables eventually. <clears throat> But overall, it's not really the right choice for, for Cube Proxy. Um, the big thing is that IPVS only does load balancing, and Cube Proxy needs to do more than that. It needs to drop some packets, it needs to masquerade things, um, and you know, in Calico, can't use IPVS at all. It needs to do network policy and all that stuff. Um, so the Cube Proxy IPVS backend actually has a lot of IP tables in it. So if we wanted to keep it working after rel drop support for IP tables, we would have to have ported all of that to NF tables. And then at that point, why not just port the rest to NF tables as well? Um, the other thing is that the IPVS backend never quite worked exactly the way we wanted it to, because Kubernetes wants service proxying to work in a very specific way. There are all these features like topology and traffic policy that you know, put slight tweaks on how your services work. And IPVS you know, doesn't have those concepts built in, obviously. And so the Kube proxy backend ends up having to sort of pre-process some of the connections to get the load balancing to work out right. And that's more IP tables rules. Um, and then ironically, some of the best features of IPVS that make people like it are things that Kube Proxy can't take advantage of anyway. You know, you can tell your IPVS server, I want to do maglev hashing or whatever. Um, but it doesn't help in Kube Proxy because you have a separate instance of the proxy on every node, and each one of them only sees a tiny bit of the state. So overall, it doesn't do much better than just randomly uh, assigning endpoints. So the next obvious possibility is eBPF. eBPF is great when you need to do things that the kernel doesn't have APIs for, but QProxy needs to move packets around, rewrite some packets, drop other packets. Those are all things that the kernel already knows how to do, right? net filter, routing. Um, so you know, why, why do you need to use eBPF? eBPF is sort of like a Swiss Army knife. Like it's it's great to have around to do simple things with. Um, you know, you can build your IKEA bookshelf with with a Swiss Army knife, but you wouldn't want to build a house with a Swiss Army knife. And likewise, you don't want to do a massive software engineering project with eBPF. Um, we don't write our control plane in machine language, so you know why should we write our data plane in machine language? Um, and some people might answer that with, well, performance. eBPF is so fast. It's, it, it's not as fast as the hype says. <laughs> um, there are things that eBPF can do, cool tricks with your network traffic to make things faster, but NF tables can do some of those things too. I mean, just switching everything to maps and you know, uh, constant time lookups, like Casey mentioned, will help the rule processing. Flow tables, which are something that we'll talk about later, can help some of the, uh, packet, the packet latency. Throughput. And then the other thing is that eBPF is just a lot. 
like the tooling is very hard to use. The documentation is mostly lacking. Uh, you often need to have a very, very new kernel, and so either you have to tell your users you need to update to the latest release, or you have to provide a backward compatibility implementation. Um, there's no support for Go to eBPF translation anywhere, which means that if we were going to use eBPF and QProxy, we would have to write it in either C or Rust or something else. So all of those problems are things that you, you, know, you can get around, but for SIG network, it didn't seem to make sense. Um, it would, sorry. Uh, it would just be too difficult to get the existing team, you know, suddenly knowing all of this eBPF stuff and writing Rust or whatever, and um, it, it seemed to make more sense to just stay away from eBPF. That doesn't mean everybody should. Calico actually has an eBPF backend, but it didn't seem to make sense for SIG network and Cube proxy. So none of these are bad APIs. IPVS would probably be great if you're writing gateway API. eBPF is great for probes and observability. Um, can be used for bigger things if you're, you're ready to deal with it. OVS I didn't talk about before, but it's great if you're writing a whole data plane, but it, it's hard to move packets in and out of OVS, so it, it wouldn't really work for Cube proxy where it just wants to be one small piece of the data plane with other stuff going around it. <laughs> NFTables is the most general purpose Linux network stack API. Um, and it, it made sense for, our, for us and probably makes sense for a lot of your use cases as well. So to improve performance in, in, in the NF tables, Cube Proxy, and Calico, what, what did we do? Um, so Casey already mentioned that the, the ON versus O1. Um, in IP tables, we have a separate IP tables rule for each service. So we have a rule that says, if the destination IP is this, go to this chain. If the destination IP is that, go to this other chain. And then within each chain, there are multiple rules for each endpoint. And this really adds up. You know, if you have 30,000 services, you're going to have more than 100,000 IP tables rules. In NF tables, we have one rule. Well, for, for this particular service thing, just if the destination IP is in the services VMAP, then apply the verdict from that map. And then we just have a map that has one entry for each service, in this case, mapping an IP to uh, a jump rule. So in this case, there's only one rule. The hash map lookup is very fast, um, and everything is faster. Um, Calico also had some yeah, similar um, optimizations. So, so in Calico, the opportunity to optimize these rules is not quite as great, mostly because of, well, a few things. Um, for one, the rules that we write scale differently with different factors. Um, largely, they scale based off of things local to the node, so the number of running workloads, for example, which is a much smaller number than all of the services and all of the endpoints in the cluster. Um, plus, just the nature of network policy means that we can get away with IP sets using, um, uh, allowing us to avoid making as many updates as workloads in the cluster change. Um, but uh, yeah, there were still some, some good wins for us to have here. So we did a very similar thing to, to Cube Proxy using a verdict map to allow us to simplify our um, comparatively smaller but still um, growing uh, set of dispatch chains. These are the chains that, again, dispatch from a particular uh, pod in your cluster to the policy that belongs to that pod. Um, uh, so that was a nice win. And then obviously we get um, some, some nice side effects from the other API improvements that I was talking about earlier, uh, like the ability to make incremental updates without uploading the entire rule set um, and uh, not contending for the logs. <laughs> That's the next slide. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and also, since Calico uses Cube Proxy to do the service proxying part, it benefits from everything that was changed in Cube Proxy. Um, so, what he was just saying about the rule updates so, IP tables, the way that the IP tables restore binary works is if you want to change any rule in a chain, you have to rewrite the entire chain. So when any service, if you, if you change, add, or delete a service, Cube Proxy has to rewrite the entire Cube services chain, which is you know, number of rules equal to the number of services. In the NF tables version, you can do N, uh, NFT add element, NFT delete element to just you know, add and delete the specific elements that you need. So the updates end up being much smaller. Um, 
And what I said about IP tables, that's actually fairly recent. Up until a few years ago, on every update, we would rewrite literally the entire IP tables rule set. Um, and that was even worse. So how does all this turn out in the end? Um, ironically, the initial test showed that at startup in a large cluster, QProxy NF tables mode is actually slower than IP tables mode because it turns out that the the binaries, the NFT binary, hadn't been optimized as much as the IP tables binaries have, and so it wasn't very good at dealing with a gigantic data set all at once. Um, this has already been fixed in the latest version of the binaries, but you know it will take a while for people to get that, so we'll probably put in some sort of workaround to, to break up the initial update into smaller pieces so that it can be processed more easily. As for the incremental updates, it's difficult to say given the, the data we have, how much faster it is, because with the IP tables updates, they're so slow and CPU intensive that our SIG scalability performance jobs that use IP tables use the min sync period 10 second option to tell Cube Proxy only run IP tables updates a maximum of once every 10 seconds, no matter how fast the services change. Because doing any more than that, it would just suck up all of their CPU. So the average latency for uh, a endpoint change in the IP tables uh, performance job is 10 seconds. Uh, in the NF tables version of it, it's about one and a half seconds because we don't have that min sync period, or we use the default min sync period of one second. Um, so I mean, yes, the difference is just because we're running updates more often, but we're running updates more often because we can run updates more often without completely thrashing the machine. Um, in terms of data plane latency, so for how fast it takes packets to get from one pod to another, um, again, you, you probably can't see the details of this graph. And if you download the slides later, there's a link to the talk that Nadia Pineva and Antonio Ojea gave yesterday from, observ bleh, from observability to performance, which is what this graph comes from. But the most important thing to notice here is that there are actually six bars in each column, not three. Uh, the tiny little ones are the NF tables latency, uh, which is so much smaller than the IP tables latency, you can barely see it. Um, in particular, the center column is the, the P50 latency, which is the average time that a, a packet going through the, the service uh, rules takes. Uh, the blue is in a cluster with 5,000 services, red is 10,000, yellow is 30,000. You can see, the, and then as you go further along, there's the P90, P95, and P99. Uh, numbers and yeah, the IP tables numbers just get worse and worse as the number of rules grows, whereas the NF tables numbers stay pretty flat. Um, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> when I talk about the IP tables rules, this is mostly rules in the NAT table. So IP tables has uh, NAT and filter tables. The big difference for our purposes is that the NAT table only applies to the first packet, whereas the filter table applies to every packet. In the past, we have occasionally tried to do things with the pro proxy rules where we add a lot of rules to the filter table. And if you get above 30,000 rules or so in the filter table, like the node just completely crashes. You can't even SSH in. It stops processing data basically. So every time that's happened, we've had to revert the change we made and figure out a different way to implement the same thing. And sometimes we couldn't. There are things that we wanted to do, like rejecting connections. If, if you connect to a, an unused port on a service IP, with the IP tables proxy, that connection just disappears and gets dropped. With the NF tables proxy, it will actually reject it, because we can have a rule to recognize any service IP with an unused port. Um, which we couldn't do in IP tables without adding too many rules to the filter table and completely breaking everything. So not only can we be faster, but we can do more. In terms of throughput, bandwidth, it's pretty much the same between IP tables and NF tables, and that's what we expected. But one cool feature of NF tables is something called flow tables, where once you figure out, so you have a packet that comes through vth123, goes into the proxy, gets denatted to a service IP, and then goes out through v456. And then once you've determined that that's what, that, what packets on that connection are supposed to do, you can add that connection to a flow table. And then when the next packet comes through, it will just immediately jump 
from one VETH to the other without passing through NF tables and all of the rest of the, the net filter path. Um, Antonio wrote a proof of concept of this for Cube Proxy. It showed about a 15% performance boost on, on heavy traffic service connections. Uh, Casey also did a proof of concept for Calico. Um, both cases, we're sort of trying to figure out exactly what to do with this. Um, if it needs to be configurable or if it should be by default. But again, this shows cool new things that we can do with NF tables that we couldn't do with IP tables. So basically, things are already good, but we spent a long time optimizing the IP tables cube proxy, and we've just barely started with NF tables. Um, so we expect it's actually going to get even better than it is now, hopefully. Um, but in general, programming time is better because of the differences in locking and the ability to do the, the smaller incremental updates, uh, which will then let you do updates more frequently and keep your data plane more in sync with the current state of pods and services. Uh, the packet latency is improved by having a rule set that's mostly O1 rather than ON. Um, and then we can do cool, cool new stuff. And that's yeah. what we have. Thanks, everybody. I think we've got some time for <laughs> questions. Um, if you have questions, there are mics in. Um, you, you did talk about uh, Calico and Kubeproxy. What about Kubelet? Uh, has Kubelet been modified to use NF tables? Kubelet doesn't do any IP table stuff anymore. Um, Mostly. It, it creates one rule that gets used by the IP tables wrapper to figure out whether you, you're using IP tables legacy or IP tables NFT, but that's it. So it didn't need any modifications. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit? Can you go back to the slides showing the latency uh, comparison with the graph? Yeah, can you elaborate what latency is this? Is the update latency, or it's uh, getting data plan getting the um, like a real IPs? This is the latency for a packet from one pod to go through the service proxy and reach another pod. And, and the, the previous slides you also mentioned uh, in the early days, uh, we found the NF tables is like worse compared with IP tables, right? Like. So oh. the, the one specific case where it's worse um, was at startup time, if you have a very large rule set that you need to send all at once, that is much slower. So we're, we're, we're working on fixing that. Yeah. OK. Uh, cool. Are there any benchmarks regarding like a, the when services got changed, endpoints changed, or service got removed, updated? Uh, how long does it take for IP tables or NF uh, tables to reflect that? So, so that was what I was talking about here, where we don't actually have good numbers because the, the performance tests that we use do very infrequent updates with IP tables and very frequent updates with NF tables just because of the difference in, in how much CPU they use. So it's better, but. OK, thank you. And so, I would highly, Nadia, yeah, I was going to say, I, oh. I highly recommend taking a look at Nadia and Antonio's slides here. They go into a lot of detail about uh, these numbers and, and more, and how they got them. Yeah, this might have been answered already. Sitting right over here, if you want to. <laughs> Sorry, this to might have been answered out. already, but on this slide, what is the Y scale? Is it just 1.0, the worst performance, and it's all relative, or is no, there an actual? No, it, it, it's milliseconds to something or other. I, you know, the, so this, the curve was the important way. part. So, but it, but if you if you look in their their slides, you can see all the data. They're actually they have multiple graphs of of slightly different things. And this is yeah round trip back at time. I think, from, th th I think this is actually contract metrics. Yeah, T time to get the first entry in contract or something. Or I forget. Hello. Hey. Um, have there been any efforts to migrate other components that write to IP tables, like IP mask agent or Cilium or any of the many other things that that do this, also to NF tables? And is there any coordination required to complete the migration for things that might still be writing to to legacy IP tables or to IP tables NFT? I'm not aware of work that's been done on either yeah. of Cilium or IP Mask Agent. So, uh, oh, IP Mask Agent, you mean the, the in the CNI plugins? Yeah. Yeah, that actually just merged like two weeks ago. Okay. 
so the, the, the IP mask and the uh, host or port map plugins in the CNI plugins should both support NF tables now. Um, I have uh, patches to cryo. Um, so I'm, I'm working on all of the things that are in OpenShift mm. um, and occasionally poking other people um, as, as it occurs to me. As, as far as coordination, um, so Casey mentioned that with Calico, they, you know, they were doing things with putting one rule above and one rule below because they needed to tightly integrate with what Cube Proxy is doing with their own rules. As long as you're not trying to do that, like, like you know, if, if you're just adding rules and not thinking about Cube Proxy's rules, it probably doesn't matter if you use IP tables and Cube Proxy uses NF tables. There, there's some gotchas there. Um, so oh. like if you're, uh, like I mentioned, where drops take precedence in NF tables, for example, if you are using, if you're writing any IP tables into a table that has a default policy of drop, then that drop is going to come into effect over your network policy mm -hmm. actions. Makes sense, thank you. Hi, isn't, uh, I uh, is it IPBS has got more than one mode? The performance metrics that you shared, is it a specific mode you had put up on? I don't know. I, I grabbed that you know, off some old blog post. Um, so I, I, you can actually it's click the link in the slides. The default, and, 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 IPBS yeah, so I think is. probably RR is the default, so that's probably what it was using. OK. Um, but, but like I was saying, the, the choice of, of mode in IPBS ends up not mattering a whole lot because each node only sees one small percentage of, of the traffic, and so it, it can't really take advantage of, of being clever a, as much. So uh, sitting on the top, uh, how does a service definition or endpoint slices, whatever you have shared, does it have any relevance to using one versus another when it comes to service being an endpoint slice or a service endpoint, right? So does it have any difference? Whatever you are shared here is at the kernel level, which is much lower. When we work as an application at the Kubernetes, we are concerned about the service and point slices and so forth. So I mean, yeah, from that point of view, nothing changes. Like QProxy just works the way it always works. Services work, endpoint slices work, yeah. Okay, no difference then, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, I was curious, did you ever uh, with IP tables, notice issues with the uh, with the the rule set getting locked, where the node would start to fail or have health issues, or you know pods wouldn't be able to be scheduled. Do you ever notice anything like that in um, just the experience with IP tables? Yeah, I mean, I would say I've definitely seen issues with IP tables where nodes effectively become unresponsive, yeah. largely because. Um, We'll spin all of our cycles trying to load and reprogram large rule sets um, and then wait for a lock. So uh, especially in large clusters that have a large number of services, complex network policies, uh, or a high rate of churn in, in uh, endpoints within the cluster, um, I've certainly seen that sort of behavior. Now, I wouldn't expect it on smaller or medium-sized uh, clusters, though. Got it. That makes sense. It usually wouldn't resolve on its own, right? It would just sort of, or it depends on the cluster. Uh, it depends, yeah. yeah. It depends on what's what's triggering that Got scenario. Yeah, thank you. Hi, you mentioned that once the IPVS was taken as a successor of IP table, but didn't achieve 100% complexity. So uh, now the uh, NF table has achieved 100 complexity, right? Uh, yeah, the, there are some features of IP tables that we intentionally dropped because we decided they were a bad idea, like uh, particularly using node ports on localhost. Um, and there are metrics in the IP tables proxy that will alert you if you're using one of those features so that you know that you might have problems with switching to NF tables. Um, there is currently no plan to change the default uh, value or the default mode in Cube Proxy, just because we're worried about, you know, there's so many possible compatibility issues. Like, you know, for instance, Cube Proxy doesn't know if you're running Calico or not, so we can't just switch to NF tables mode, which wouldn't work if Calico was still using IP tables and things like that. So probably the default won't actually change, but we will start recommending that people use NF tables mode. 
I see. Um, but now NFT table is in beta mode. Yeah. Uh, do you see any risk if uh, you all start to adopt it right now? Nope. Um, you know, we, we definitely had some bug reports in alpha um, and, and dealt with those. Um, but it, 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 we haven't heard anything bad about beta other than the slow startup time if you, in, in big clusters. OK, thanks. Sounds like that might be it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.